uh, thanks for watching today. I am Kathy Obradovich from the Des Moines Register, and we are here with Senator Michael Bennett. He is a Democratic candidate for president. Welcome, Senator Thank Bennett. you for having me. Uh, we also have some members of the Register and the board and staff here, some of whom you can see and some you probably can't. But let's uh, just uh, go down the line and introduce yourselves, please. I'm Richard Doak, a member of the editorial board. Rock Snyder, editorial board member. Um, and, and, and municipal government. And That's right. <laughs> yes. yes, and, and, and. Uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you want to be president. Thank, 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 you, thank, you, for thank you for having me this morning and thanks for making time. Um, before I came to the Senate, I spent my life basically outside of politics. I was in business uh, in Colorado doing resurrecting dis distressed companies across the country. And then I became super the Denver Public Schools, a job that I had for five years. Denver Public Schools, like so many other urban school districts in America, has the vast majority of the kids live in poverty. The achievement rates were the lowest in the state. The growth was lower than any other district. Cutting the budget for years and years and years as we hemorrhaged students because we weren't offering an academic background that uh, parents and kids wanted. We changed that and over the last 15 years, you know, while I was there and since I've been gone, um, we, we made, made a lot of changes, changes and last week, week or the week before Stanford University came, came out with a report that showed, showed that the growth of the students in Denver is so much greater than the kids in the rest of the state that it's as if they had an additional 60 days of school each year for the past three years, which is a substantial amount of school on a 180-day calendar. Um, we have a long way to go. We have achievement gaps that are uh, massive between kids of color and, and Anglo kids. We've got in between kids that are wealthy and kids that are poor, but we've made a lot of progress over the period of time. We decreased the dropout rate by 75 percent. We doubled the college going rate uh, for kids of color. And I evaluate the work I do in the Senate based on whether we're serving the kids that I used to work for well and we're serving their parents well. I think over the last 10 years, we've done almost nothing to serve them well. And my belief is that if we perpetuate the politics that we've had for the last 10 years for another 10 years, my generation will be the first generation of Americans to leave less opportunity to our kids and our grandkids. And I don't think there's any excuse for it. I think it's ridiculous that we've accepted basically um, a tyranny by these guys called the Freedom Caucus and, and led by Mitch McConnell that has disabled our, uh, our ability to govern ourselves, uh, disabled our exercise in self-government in the name, ironically, of the Founding Fathers. You know, what they're perpetuating is really a Sarah Palin cartoon version of what the Founding Fathers were doing, not what the actual Founding Fathers were doing. And my belief is that it is up to us, all of us, senators, editorial board writers, journalists, citizens, to overcome this blockade um, in, in, our, in our national government and begin to legislate again for the future of this country and for the interests of our kids and our grandkids and for America's place in the world. All of that is being sacrificed today. And Donald Trump in that, and I'll stop here, sorry to go on. Donald Trump. Okay. Donald Trump in that story is a symptom rather than a cause of these problems. You know, he, he, he arose out of 40 years of economic immobility in America for, for 90 percent of Americans, the greatest income inequality that we've seen since 1928, a system of education that is reinforcing the income inequality we have in this country rather than liberating people from it, and, and, a, and a people that became un hopeless, I would say, about making progress. And at the same time, you know, in this kind of um, frenzy of, of sort of a social media fever and the collapse of print journalism and, and all the rest that I don't need to tell you about, um, we decided to put a reality TV star in charge of America because we said we can't do any worse. And it turns out you can do worse. He's created a lot of harm for this country, for people living in this country and for America's place in the world. He's done a tremendous amount of damage. Um, but this, for me, is not just about stopping that damage. It's about replacing it with a theory of how we govern again 
uh, that allows us to move the country forward. And I think the world needs this. You know, at a moment when China is rising, the way China is rising, a totalitarian surveillance state, um, and we can't get our heads out of the cable headlines every day, which means, you know, we've literally wasted seven months, eight months, nine months of the American people's time over the stupidity of Donald Trump's six billion dollars for his wall that Mexico was supposed to pay for, while China is building 3,500 miles of fiber, fiber optic cable from Latin America to Africa to connect it back to China. This is the opportunity cost of the era that we're living through. To say nothing of the damage that he's done to rural America, but I'm sure we'll come to that in a minute. Well, apply your your theory of improving how we govern to the current uh, debate on gun violence, tragedies in Gilroy, Dayton, El Paso. Yeah. Seem to create another opportunity to talk about this, but as we know, those opportunities come and go. Um, yeah. You know what? What do you do to change? We should have. We should have. We should have been. I think that we should have been able to get background checks done after Sandy Hook. I can't think of a worse fact pattern than what happened to that elementary school and those kids in Sandy Hook. And we didn't have the discipline to focus on the background check. So we had f four or five different votes on the floor of the Senate and the NRA was able to uh, tell America we were trying to take people's guns away, which is not what the effort was about. And we weren't focused strategically on the background check. So it actually fits in perfectly to my theory of the case because since that time, tragically, tragedy after tragedy after tragedy, uh, beginning with Sandy Hook, really, um, have mobilized mo mothers all over this country to fight for their children, have mobilized students all over America to fight for our children. This is perfect. These are perfect examples of what we, we should be asking of our citizens in this democracy. They are doing exactly what needs to be done. They are laying the political predicate for the work that needs to be done to overcome the NRA. Now the politicians that are on their side need to be as strategic as the people that are on the other side of this issue. And I think what that looks like is championing this background check bill that, um, that the House has already passed and demanding that Mitch McConnell put it on the floor for a vote. And if he's unwilling to do that, he needs to be held accountable politically for being unwilling to do it. That's how the system works. It's not, it's not hoping, it's not crossing your fingers. It's organizing, it's mobilizing, and then it's being strategic about the work. I mean, I could go down the list on climate, on judges. Why do we have a climate denier in the White House when a majority of Americans believe climate change is real and it's something that we need, you know, that we need to fix it? Before we move on to the guns, some of your Democratic competitors, including Senator Harris, who was here yesterday, uh, have said they'll take executive action um, on things like background checks, assault weapon ban, if Congress fails or refuses to act. Is that the right path? I think that where a president can legitimately use executive action on a range of issues from guns to climate um, in a lawful manner that respects the Constitution um, and that reflects public sentiment in this country, it's legitimate for them to do it. If it doesn't reflect public sentiment, it's not going to last for very long. And, and if it's not constitutional, it's not legitimate to do it. But to me, it's a much less preferable way of running the government than what we should be doing, which is having regular order in our legislature, legislature and having the branches of government do the job that they do. There's a big difference of opinion in this race about this. My view is that we cannot accept Mitch McConnell's degraded view of political practices in our institutions. There are other people whose view is you gotta fight fire with fire and you gotta do exactly what he's doing. If that's where we're headed, we're at the end of the Roman Empire, at the end of the Roman Republic. That's where we are because the metal on metal partisanship that McConnell is practicing, the rule breaking that he did with, um, with Merrick Garland, if, that's, if we're just gonna repeat that stuff, we will never, this democracy will never be able to solve the gun issue or climate change or create universal health care because we're just on a one-way ratchet down smashing this place into smithereens. I don't think the next generation of Americans should accept that from us and I don't think we should accept it of ourselves. Well, how would a Democratic president solve that problem in the Senate basically? Isn't going to go Democrat anytime soon apparently. How, how, how do you as president work better with the, the 
Republicans. Well, first of all, first of all, I don't ex give up the idea that the Democrats could win the majority. I think Democrats could win the majority this time, and I think we could sustain it um, going forward because I, Donald Trump is so far outside the mainstream of conventional American political thought, including Republican conventional thought, that. I think there's an opportunity for us to win in unusual states because of where he is, if we're smart about it. Um, uh, I also don't think that um, Mitch McConnell and the Freedom Caucus will work with any Democratic president. I don't think they will. Th I don't think they're open to any compromise. I don't think they're open to any reasonable um, uh, uh, legislation. I'm sorry to say that. That's not what I thought 10 years ago, but that's what I believe today. So I think that what a Democratic president needs to do is build a constituency for change out in the country of Democrats, independents, and some Republicans uh, around a policy agenda that can actually attract the attention of the American people and, and just be relentless about closing over a broken Washington. You know, And we either have to beat these guys, these Freedom Caucus guys, or we've got to um, find a way to close over them. So, that's why I've offered the climate proposal that I've offered. That's why I've offered the health care proposal that I've offered. That's why I've offered, you know, the, 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 the various policy approaches that I've offered because I'm thinking not only about the primary and not only about the general election, but what it's going to take to pursue a set of policies that unites the country rather than divides the country further uh, in an era of divided politics. And by the way, I don't think this is about just one election. I think this is about all the elections for the rest of my life. That's how, that's how rough the shape is that we're in right now. And it's going to take us a long time to recover from it. You may have just partially answered <coughs> this question, but um, since the debates, a lot of the conversation in the Democratic Party has been you know, whether it should choose someone who is backing Medicare for all and some of the farther left policies um, or uh, someone more like you who takes more of a pro pragmatic approach um, is considered to be um, maybe more of a moderate. I I'm wondering whether you think that's actually a healthy conversation for the party to have during the primary, or are your words about Medicare for all, et cetera, not being pa practical going to come back and haunt the party? Well, it's in not, I don't, I don't, I, look, it's a conversation we have to have. We have to have it. And I, but, and I don't accept the terms of you know, who's progressive and who's moderate in this race. I don't think that we should allow Medicare for all, which has been presented by somebody who won't even call himself a Democrat, calls himself a Democratic Socialist, um, to, be, to set the standard for what the Democratic base in this party should support, or that what's progressive in the party. Um, I salute Bernie Sanders for his ideological conviction. I salute him for his honesty, because unlike other people that are describing his plan, he's being honest about his plan. But his plan is something that the American people will not accept. 180 million people are not going to accept getting thrown off their private insurance for the, for the virtue of paying $33 trillion more dollars in taxes. That's not going to happen. That's at the heart of Bernie Sanders' plan. And I'm not making up. Those aren't Republican talking points. Those are Bernie's talking points. And he believes that they will. He believes that they will. And he believes that, you know, because his insurance plan will be better than any existing insurance plan, in his view, people are willing to give up their choice and, again, pay $33 trillion in taxes, which, just for, just for a sense of scale, that's equivalent to 70% of all the taxes we're going to collect over the next 10 years. You tell me, is Iowa ready for that? Well, he says that's going to come from Wall Street speculators. Well, d d no, he doesn't. He says part of it will, but he's raising taxes on everybody in America making $29,000 or more. That's his plan, and it only pays for half of it. He only pays for half of it, raising taxes on people 29 and above. Co Senator Harris has said she's going to be able to do it on California speculators. That, whatever that is, that's much less than half of what that plan is going to cost. And this is why he couldn't get it through Vermont. Vermont you know, had a governor who's a very good guy, ran for governor on a single-payer system. The minute that people figured out what it was going to cost, they rejected it. And California rejected it. Colorado rejected 80-20. So for me, this isn't about progressive versus not progressive. This is about lousy policy and, and following that lousy policy, lousy politics. Much better to have 
a public option that leads us much more quickly to universal health care, preserves the choice, raises taxes on nobody, gives everybody in America the opportunity to make the choice they can for their family, doesn't increase our deficit one dollar. Um, and my plan, which I wrote long before I was running for president, Medicare X, starts in rural areas in this country because just like in rural Iowa, in rural Colorado, that's where people have been hit the most because there's one or less insurers in many of these places because there's no competition. And 10 years ago, when people might have said to me, you know, we don't want any part of your Bolshevik plan to extend the government stuff, this year what I'm hearing from people is thank you for thinking of us. We appreciate the fact that you've thought of us. Now, I'll give you a progressive plan. A progressive plan is uh, my plan with Sherrod Brown to dramatically increase two things. One, um, uh, the child tax credit. It's called the American Family Act, and it, that's, that's Bennett Brown. And the other is uh, Brown Bennett, which is a big increase in the earned income tax credit. Sherrod ran a race in Ohio on the dignity of work. He's the only Democrat that survived in Ohio. Tough state. He won that race even before he started that race because people know where Sherrod Brown stands. And the American Family Act, my, my bill, would, would, would uh, according to Columbia University, reduce childhood poverty in this country by almost 40 percent. It would end $2 a day poverty in this country. As somebody who's been a public school superintendent, I can tell you that would make a massive difference in this country for families and for kids. It costs 3 percent of what Medicare for All costs. So I guess I look, huh? Yeah, t refundable all the way to the to, to, to dollar one. It increases it so, and pays it out on a monthly basis. So 300 bucks per kid under the age of six, 250 bucks per kid on, over the age of six, going up to about $180,000. Um, uh, so it is, it is progressive. It is, uh, it doesn't add one federal bureaucrat. You know, there are a lot of libertarians that support the proposals that I have made. So. When there is an opportunity to actually work in a bipartisan way, I think it can form the basis for bipartisan support. Um, and, and it has the very, very, very substantial impact on our society of lifting a bunch of kids out of poverty. I would rather spend my time over the next 10 years working on that kind of stuff than a failed effort to legislate Bernie's Medicare for All. I just would. I, I think that that would be a much better use of our time, much better use of our time to spend our time on climate, much better f use of our time to spend our time on investing in, in infrastructure and in, and in developing the rural economy in America. These are all choices that are getting, I think, warped in this social media haze that we're in, where we've sort of decided that somehow the base of the Democratic Party is the virtual base that exists on social media rather than the actual people in their living rooms in Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. And though I think those people are, are aligned completely with my policy positions. And another choice that you mentioned yesterday at the Registry's political soapbox at the fair was that you'd rather promote pre free preschool than free college. Um, do you actually support free preschool? Is that something that you think the country ought to pursue? Is that something that you, a I, federal goal of yours? And, and why not? I, I absolutely believe that as a country, we need to aspire to universal preschool in this country. We have to. And people may see, say, well, that's an impossibility for us to do. We got to figure it out. When we had, um, when it was clear to us that getting a middle school degree was not going to prepare you for college or for the economy, we invented high school and we transformed our economy. If you talk to any kindergarten school teacher in America, they will tell you that if kids don't have access to preschool, um, they're going to start dropping out the day they walk into kindergarten. And the reason for that is that if you're born into poverty, uh, you've heard 30 million fewer words than, than your more affluent peers by the time you hit the door of your kindergarten. 30 million it, individual, each individual. So I think that really should be a focus. I don't believe that the federal government should be responsible for all of that. I think the federal government should be a partner with states and local communities to do it. Denver raised a sales tax increase there that's paying for preschool. The Denver Public Schools is the only time I was ever accused of outcompeting anybody when I was superintendent. But in one year, we went from having 500 kids in preschool to having more than 2,000 kids in preschool. Their lives are transformed as a result of that. 
In a state that doesn't require or pay for uh, until recently full day kindergarten, we were able to go to full day kindergarten without charging people for that. So um, I do believe that's what we need to do, but that's not all we need to do. I mean, our, if you look, as I said earlier, our education system is reinforcing the income inequality we have. That's an important thing to take in because w what's happening in America is that the best predictor of the quality of your education is your parents' income. The line is so tight that you can't even, when it's on a graph, I have it if you want it in a deck. Why don't you give that to me? It, you know, the line is savage between what your parents' income is and what the quality of your education is. It also is savage on what your income is. These things all are lined up like this. It looks, you can't see three lines. You can only see one line. That's it in America. So that's not always been true. There was a time when education was the wind at our back uh, after World War II and the GI Bill was put in place. We were getting used to high school. Women were coming into uh, higher education, people of color transformed millions of lives, transformed our economy. We need to do that again. So universal preschool, yes. K-12 schools that, that are actually designed for the 21st century, not the 19th century. It's going to be hard to do that. We need to do that. And part of the reason why we don't is that the, the responsibility is so diffuse to, to go to the implication of your question. There's federal responsibility, state, local. As president, that's a conversation I would love to lead. I would not, as the superintendent of the Denver Public Schools, want to be told by anybody in Washington what I had to do with my schools or with the kids in my schools. So talk, but talk the need. More about that. How, how, what is the role of the federal government? I, well, let me. So, so uh, you, you know, as a yeah, I'll come to a very specific right. example. A very specific example. Seventy percent of the kids in America that graduate from high school don't go to college or don't finish college. And because of the way our system is designed, it's not because of our economy, but the way our education system is designed, those kids cannot earn more than a minimum wage. That is all they can earn because they don't have the skills to earn a living wage in the economy. If we transform our high school and we transform uh, community college with that objective in mind, the objective being when you have a high school degree burnished by, let's say, a year of an associate's degree, which you can acquire in high school, that our expectation as a nation is going to be, you can earn this, not earn this. That's not a Pollyannish pie-in-the-sky view of the world. And what the federal government could do would be to say, we will pay for the fixed costs of aligning these systems and aligning the needs of employers in communities throughout America, the data systems that are required, the alignment of curriculum that's required. And from the federal government's vantage point, it's not a lot of money. From the point of view of people working in these districts every day who are already underwater and couldn't possibly organize themselves to be able to do this um, uh, because they just don't have the time on their hands or the fixed, or the, or the fixed cost. To, it would make a transformative difference. And I think that alone, if that's all you did, uh, that would make a transformation for millions of Americans who are graduating from high school into an economy that can't today support them, uh, and it would transform the American economy. And that's just one thing. I mean, there are a bunch of other things we could do. Part of it is benchmarking what we're doing against international norms as a country and saying, look, the federal government is never going to decide well, some people are proposing that we would, but the federal government is never going to be the place where we pay teachers, mostly. That's going to be state and local governments. But we have to recognize the fact that we are partly in a crisis because um, the whole way that we pay and, and, and reward teachers and the whole way we think about training teachers and, and, and moving them through their career all was designed in a labor market that discriminated against women and said, you've got two professional choices. One's being a teacher and one's being a nurse. And in that old labor market, we, through discrimination, we said, we basically subsidized our education system. And what we said to women was, we're going to pay you a ridiculously low salary, but if you pay, teach Julius Caesar every year for 30 years of your life, we're going to give you a pension that you're going to be able to retire on, which sounded pretty good because your spouse was probably going to die before you. That was a that was a that was an incentive structure that was aligned to that American reality. 
that reality hasn't been with us for 50 years. And if we're not going to change that, then we should expect to keep losing 50% of the people from the teaching profession in the first five years. The federal government will never be the main driver of any of that, but we have a national, it seems to me, we, have, we should have a national concern with the fact that, we, you know, as, or we should be asking ourselves a national question, which is where are the next two million teachers going to come from in this country? And what are we going to do about the fact that only nine out of 100 poor kids ever graduates from college in America? I mean, we, we will not recognize our democracy. If you, if you extrapolate those dem our demographic changes and those academic outcomes over the next 40 years of American history, we will not recognize our democracy or, or our capitalist system uh, because of our failures to intervene. And that would be tragic. Let's talk about immigration for a second. Um, you were part of the <coughs> Senate gang of eight that crafted the very last bipartisan bill, uh, I think, on, on immigration. It seems like Congress has just gotten farther apart since. Um, and we talked a little bit about you know, how do you overcome partisan divisions and inaction, but it, it seems like there is a lot of agreement around certain elements of immigration reform. We just can't get anything through the U.S. Congress. So what do you do about that? This goes back a little bit to your question about what a president can do. So I was worried about the, the grading politics around immigration before I was part of the Gang of Eight. And there was a Republican attorney general. Most of my ideas are not my ideas. I steal them from other people. Uh, there was a Republican attorney general from Utah who had uh, written something called the Utah Compact. There was a set of principles around immigration. And so I set out to write a Colorado Compact. I didn't write it. I set out to wander around Colorado to have conversations with people all over my state, which just for it's a, only a state away from your state, by the way. It's a very, very familiar place. To, I mean, this is a very familiar place to me. It feels like I'm at home. That state is a third Democratic, a third Republican, a third Independent, like you guys. You know, it's got a big uh, city and a bunch of other places. You guys have more, you know, you've got a little bit different. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but it, there are a lot of profound similarities. And I went out to try to develop a set of principles, which we did develop over the course of a period of months. The first signatories on this bill, and they still support it, the first signatories on that compact was a group called Club 20, which is the 20 Western Slope counties in my state. The Club 20 is one of the most conservative organizations in Colorado. Farmers, ranchers, oil and gas, um, but they see the stupidity of our current immigration system and they know it needs to be fixed or they're going to lose their farms and their ranches. And they signed up to it. In fact, the day that we announced all of this at the University of Denver, there was Club 20 and there were the most progressive Im immigrant right activists in the, um, in the state who were people I knew from my superintendent's days because that's when I first started to understand this issue because I'd be meeting ninth graders who for the first time would understand that they couldn't go to college because of, we later changed that, but they couldn't go to college because of their immigration status. So we created a thing called the Colorado Compact. That became very important to me as a member of the Gang of Eight because I was able to say, no, no, that's not what Republicans believe. This is what Colorado Republicans believe. I was able to assert that. This is what Republicans, Democrats, and Independents believe about immigration. What you're saying is false. What Fox News is saying is false. What Fox News is doing to divide the country so they can sell advertising is false. And this is what America really wants, Colorado really wants. And that was enormously helpful when we got into the negotiations with the Gang of Eight, which, by the way, is where I still think. I mean, I know it intuitively. I know it from the polling. The elements of that legislation are still where America is on this. Pathway to citizenship for the 11 million people over a 13-year uh, period required people to learn English, required people to pass two background checks. The most progressive DREAM Act ever, for the, ever conceived for the DREAMers um, was not only conceived, but it was supported by 68 senators. $46 billion in border security. $46 billion. We have spent two years with this, this president of ours, with his ineffective and medieval wall that, some, that Mexico was supposed to pay for. We had 40, and he's saying the Democrats are for open borders. 
$46 billion of border security, but it was 21st century technology. It was technology that we had acquired in Afghanistan and Iraq that would allow us to see every single millimeter of the border, 350 miles of border fence, double the number of, bo of border security agents. Lindsey Graham said at the time they could hold hands on the border. There were so many border security agents. We have a whole system in America. 40% of the people that are here that are undocumented um, uh, came here lawfully and overstayed their visa. We have no capacity to know who those people are, whether we want them to stay, whether we want them to go. We solved that problem in that bill. E-Verify, the agricultural provisions. I negotiated those provisions with Marco Rubio, Orrin Hatch, uh, Diane Feinstein, and it's the first time that the agricultural provisions of an immigration bill were endorsed by the growers and by the farm workers union. That had never happened before. So I have to say it was one of the better moments of my t 10 years in the Senate, and it's the way legislation should be approached. I mean, we worked for seven months on that bill. Then we took it to the Judiciary Committee. The Judiciary Committee had an open amendment process. More Republican amendments were accepted than Democratic amendments. Then it went to the floor. There was a whole amendment process on the floor. Then it passed with 68 votes. That is how a bill becomes a law according to Schoolhouse Rock. And that is the way it's supposed to work. And that is a pluralist process. This is the genius of the founders. In, in, in practice, that's what it looks like. And Congress doesn't do that anymore. In Mitch McConnell's Senate, there are no amendments anymore. We were headed that way, in fairness, before he got there. But it's been dreadful. There are no amendments. And why didn't it pass? It didn't pass because of the tyranny of the Freedom Caucus. In the House, those 40 people were able to say, no, you need to follow the Hastert rule, name for a guy who's in prison. And we never got a vote, and Boehner lost his speakership in the end, and Ryan did nothing in the end, and Steve King won. Steve King won. And that's what we, I think that's what America has to close over. That's what we have to figure out how to do. That's what it's, is at stake in this election. And I do believe there is the basis for incredible bipartisan support here, but we got to understand what we're contending with. We're contending with a president who's lying, every day about immigration in America and has lied about it since the day he rode that escalator down in that Trump Tower with the gold lame on the outside and said Mexicans are rapists. We're contending with a Fox News who's lied night after night after night after night about Im what immigrants are doing to this country and ignoring the contribution that they've made. We are contending with a Republican National Committee who to their everlasting shame has spent money in states like Iowa, states like North Dakota, in Indiana, Missouri, b spewing lies and hatred about immigrants. John Tester, who's a friend of mine from Montana, who just won re-election barely in Montana, tells a story that I recount in my book of sitting in his tractor in Big Sandy, Montana, listening to Trump, who had come in to campaign for his opponent, talking about MS-16, the gang. And John's sitting there on the tractor saying, there hasn't been a member of MS-16 within 1,000 miles of Montana ever. But the number one issue in those races was this. And when I say this is going to take all of us to overcome it, I mean it. This is what it's going to take to overcome it. It's going to take the Des Moines Register contending with this every day. It's going to take the president contending with it every day. It's going to take citizens contending with it every day. That is what it's going to take, and it's going to require a president who shows up in red parts of the country where I will never win more than 30 percent of the vote, just like I showed up in Club 20 for 10 years. That's how I got those guys on that immigration thing, and they saw their own interest in it. Um, it's going to require somebody who can go there and talk to people and say, this is why we're moving in the direction that we're going to go. Can I mention one more thing in this context? I'm sorry to go on for so long, but it just reminds me. It just yesterday the day before I was in a meeting and it occurred to me in this conversation what does it say about us that we elected somebody who turned John McCain into the butt of a joke about um, who's a hero and who's a patriot here's a guy who spent five years in solitary confinement and you know having fought for America and who's one of the greatest heroes of the 20th century, in my view. And I know him. I love the guy. He was part of the Gang of Eight. 
And yet, we, in the stew of this insanity, we allowed Trump to turn him into to a, you know, a, like an object of derision. And that was repeated night after night after night after night on Fox News as well. We wouldn't allow, I hope nobody in this room would allow their children to talk about John McCain without punishing them. And if, you, if your parent or grandparent talked about John McCain like that, you would be ashamed and embarrassed. It just strikes me that there, there, it's, such a, it's so emblematic of how off the rails we went with the election of Donald Trump and how far we have to come to get this country back to the place it needs it? to be. How do you explain that his approval ratings are still pretty high? I mean, how do you explain I think I explain it, I explain it based on, I, expl I think a huge amount of it is Fox. I think it is an organ of the state. And when you are spending a hundred hours, there are places in this country that I used to visit 30 years ago that were Republican, where the Weather Channel was on all day long. And that has been replaced by Fox News. And they are perpetuating a set of lies that um, I think are threatening to bring this country to its knees. I mean, look at what they've done on the Russia stuff. I'm on the Intelligence Committee. This is actually a very serious issue. This is not a game. I don't know if you saw the front page of the New York Times yesterday, but the story about Sweden should be, did, did you see it? I mean, I mean, here Trump makes up stuff about what's going on in Sweden, and two days later, there are Russian journalists that are being paid as provocateurs who are trying to pay other people to act out the stuff that Trump described. He goes to Helsinki and stands next to Donald Trump and stands next to Vladimir Putin and says, I take Putin's word, not the American intelligence agency's word. That's what our president said. Fox News goes right with him. He goes to Japan and he makes a joke about it. Fox News goes right with him. Columnists in America who should know much better are saying, this whole issue is a distraction. You know, it shouldn't be something that anybody talks about. The Intelligence Committee, in a bipartisan way, made it very clear that, we, that our democracy was attacked by these people. Not these people, by Putin. And that, our, that, our, that, our, that the vote itself in this country is vulnerable to Russian interference and Russian attack. And we have a news media in this country that every day is repeating the lies that that uh, Trump is telling. A guy who's, who's spent his presidency claiming that other dictators who are, d who, are, who, are, who, are, who are manifestly exploiting their own people, that are destroying their own people for their own economic gain, not even for an ideological gain, but for their own economic gain, that have the United States interests completely uh, uh, have, have no alignment with our interests, and he's treating them as though they're his friends. How did that become a Republican point of view? How, how did the Russian interference in America become something that if you were going to be a Republican, you had to deny? You know? Or that this is, this, this is the world turned on its head. I think a big part of it also is that People saw 10 years of the immobility of our governing structure, and they said, which it was, it was immobilized. I mean, this is long before Trump got there, it was immobilized. And without being able to cast blame, really, they just said, you know, we're going to blow the place up. We, 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 we're not, the thing isn't working for us. The economy's, you know, terrible for us. We can't do any worse. We're going to blow the place up. And... Now we know there's huge, a huge price to pay. There's a huge price to pay with our transatlantic alliance. There's a huge price to pay with our economic integration with Asia, which has been destroyed by this president. There's a huge price to pay for farmers who are having their soybean uh, markets taken away by Brazil. There's a huge price to pay by farmers that are paying for these tariffs. There's a huge price to pay with Iran out there being able to, you know, doing what Iran is now doing as a result of this president leaving a deal that he should never have left. There's a huge price to pay for every single American child 
who has not gotten the benefit of a better, not a single one, a single hour of a better education because Donald Trump is president. There's a huge price to pay because he's the first American president to take health care away from millions of Americans. No American president has ever done that. Donald Trump has done that. And like I said yesterday, you know, I think he and McConnell are probably re responsible for mo putting more debt on the balance sheet of this country than any American politicians that came before them. So McConnell more than Trump. McConnell more than Trump. But we're going to have a $2 trillion deficit next year, essentially at full employment, because these people, they have grown government more in the first two years of the Trump presidency than Barack Obama group government during the depths of the worst recession in the Great Depression. That's when we were, our food stamps were increasing because we were in the Great Recession. That's when we passed the stimulus package. They have spent more than that, and that's without the tax cuts for rich people. So if you're president and you've got a, a democratically controlled Senate and House, how do you go back to balanced budgets and reducing the debt? It's going to require, it's going to require, I mean, I think the optimal, the, to be totally honest with you, I think the optimal moment to do that is in divided government. Okay, but because you're going to need is, everybody. What does it look like? Well, so today, I, I mean, it's, it's going to be a long time getting back to some sort of balance. We are, and, and I just want to be clear about this. The Freedom Caucus who ran on the basis of being fiscally responsible have destroyed the fiscal condition of this country. I just want to be clear about that. That all these guys, these Steve Kings, the the people that ranted and raved over the Recovery Act, they are the ones that are pushing us over the edge. Bill Clinton left us with a $5 trillion projected surplus over the next 10 years. Obama inherited a $1.2 trillion deficit. At the worst, it was 1.5. When he left, it was 600 or 500. So he more than halved what he was given. And in a year, Trump has taken it to a trillion dollars on the way to two trillion and it's a disgrace with, and with, so with the democrats some, with some democratic and i'll say the democrats in general national democrats don't care much about this issue and national republicans say they care but they're lying and that is worse from my point of view because the hypocrisy is you know and and it goes back to your question all this stuff turns out not to be about the fiscal stuff it turns out to be about dismantling the federal government. And if you can draw, I used to walk through the Denver International Airport wondering why anybody would want to work in a place with a 9% approval rating, which the Congress has, you know, and I'd want to have a paper bag over my head because of how stupid the last week's activities had been in Washington. And I knew how hard the people in the Denver Public Schools were working. I knew how hard that my old colleagues in the private sector were working. And I knew what a clown car the last week had been in Washington. I finally understood that there's an answer to the question. And the answer is, if you think you have been sent there to destroy the federal government, it suits your purposes perfectly. So all the shutdowns, all the fiscal cliffs, all of the disagreement, the agitation, the agitation. And in the end, Trump is the answer to that. Because the things, a circus, you might as well put a guy that you'd like to be the, you know, the lead carnival barker in charge of it. And that's what they did. Okay. And what we're going to have to do, we are now, we are now, we are now, uh, we are now um, collecting less than 16% of our GDP in revenue. And we are spending more than 22% of our GDP like in expenditures. You're gonna, you're gonna turn that I think you got to turn it around slowly in a bipartisan way with goal, long-term goals to try to reduce it knowing that we're not going to reduce it quickly, stop being dishonest with the American people, it's going to happen overnight, but we got to start paying our way. And that's going to mean, I think the beginning of that would be reversing the Trump tax bill. That would be a good way to start. Increase, I think that now. we should lift the cap on Social Security, and I think on Medicare costs, there is a ton we can do to reduce health care costs in this country. This is not part of our debate. We're, we're spending all our time talking about Medicare for all when the real problem out there is cost. We can cover people. We can cover people by having auto enrollment in CHIP. We can cover people by having auto enrollment in Medicare. We can cover people by having a true public option in Medicare. But that still hasn't dealt with the cost issue. And every point that we can take out of those health care costs, 
is hugely beneficial to the bottom line and hugely beneficial to our fiscal condition. I mean, we're spending roughly 18 or 19 percent of our of our GDP on health care. You know, that's twice or more than twice what any other industrialized country in the world is spending. If we could take that down by three, the problem solved, basically. And that is going to mean having a system of health care that, that incentivizes people to keep themselves healthy, uh, incentivize doctors and the whole medical system, insurance companies and others, to keep people healthy. That is a system that's weighted toward primary care and, and toward um, uh, uh, an expansion of telemedicine and primary care in rural areas, you know, so people can actually monitor them, themselves and take care of themselves. But there are examples all over America, from the Cleveland Clinic to others, where costs are being dramatically reduced, or actually, you know, either reduced or costs are being held steady. That would really change the trajectory. That would change all every one of these slides in this deck of mine that is a you know, many of which are about what you and I are now talking what about. What about ending the two decades of war that this country is involved so, in? So, and that, uh, that's, you can't talk about the budget without talking no, about that. No, no, well, look, so, look, <laughs> here's another thing we could do. We could stop doing this. Since 2001, we have cut taxes by $5 trillion. Since 2001, we've cut taxes by $5 trillion, and almost all the benefit of that has gone to the wealthiest people in America. So if you set out to say, what could I do that would be least constructive to dealing with the income inequality in America, you couldn't pick something more unconstructive than that. And by the way, we didn't spend that money. We borrowed $5 trillion from the Chinese for the privilege of giving $5 trillion of tax cuts to rich people in America. That's what we did. And our kids are stuck with that debt forever. We spent $5.6 trillion in the Middle East that we didn't, we borrowed it all from the Chinese. Every single penny we borrowed from the Chinese. So that's 11, 12, 13 trillion dollars, none of which we invested to make a better America. None of it. We might as well lit it all on fire. And that's why China is now, China's, for the first time in history, China's R&D budget is going to be higher than ours this year, not per capita. The absolute number will be higher. China's investment in infrastructure. I mean, in three years, in the last 10 years, China poured more concrete than we did in the 20th century, just for a sense of scale here. And while we're fighting over Trump's wall and my, my airport at DIA is the last, and we're very proud of it, but it's still the mo most modern airport in America, and it was built 25 years ago all over the world. People are building airports. I mean, with that $13 trillion, we could have fixed every road and bridge in America. We could have, um, we could have wired every single community in America. We could have given every teacher a 50% pay raise. We could have given every kid who needed it a full day uh, preschool. Uh, and we, c we would have had money left over to make Social Security solvent for my kids' generation. And we could have paid down some of our debt and our deficit. We could have done that. We did none of it. We lit it on fire. And I think that's what we have to stop. We don't, if, if, if we managed any local government in Iowa the way we managed the federal government, not a single person would be left. You would have banished them. You would have banished them. And these people, we need to, you know, I mean, enough is enough. We got to start governing the country again. And the Freedom Caucus, in their sort of crazy Sarah Palin way of things, and, you know, the co optation of the Reagan stuff, which, I mean, Ronald Reagan truly wouldn't recognize these people, and these people dishonor Ronald Reagan every single day, in my view. Um, uh, they have, in a sense, done a very effective, their anti-government rhetoric has kind of metastasized into a very effective separation of the federal government from the American people. You know, so the American people hate the federal government. Lots of reasons I hate the federal government. Many ways in which it's corrupt. It's been corrupted by Citizens United and all kinds of other stuff. Political gerrymandering that keeps these guys in their seats. But you know what? It isn't separate from the American people. As bad as it is, as screwed up as it is, it is our only mechanism for self-governance. It is our mechanism for governance. It is our equivalent of the Politburo. It is our equivalent of Xi Jinping. And we have to figure out, as a democratic society, how to have an attention span 
that actually can compete with a 21st century world that's governed in ways that are governed differently than we are. And I've spent the last two years writing a book about this and during the process of that, fell completely in love with our democracy again and with the idea of self-government again. But self-government is not something in the end that can be left to the politicians. It, can't it isn't a large part of all of what you're saying about the dysfunction in Russia. Isn't, aren't you basically arguing for, for a bunch of the Democratic presidential candidates to be running for the Senate and the House rather than... Well, it's not my place to... I, know, I, know. I mean, isn't but that, it's not my place. Where your argument no, is. I'm arg my argument leads to a world where... My argument leads to a world where... Um, uh, we as citizens come to understand that what the, that the standard for whether we are successful citizens um, is not whether we spend three hours a night watching cable television. It is whether we understand what it means to be a founder of this country. It is that elevated a sense. That is what citizens in America who have refounded the country over and over again have thought of themselves as they march for civil rights as they ended slavery, as they got women the right to vote, as they led a progressive era that amended the Constitution over and over and over again to fix what needed to be fixed, as they ended a gilded age then, as we need to end a gilded age now. That's what they understood. So first of all, it's us, it's citizens. What is required of us? And, and by the way, that's the opposite of I alone can fix it, which is the operating thesis of the Trump campaign and presidency. And we got we to gotta expect a lot more out of our politicians, whether they're Democrats or Republicans. And I think people need to understand the pernicious nature of this ideology that has stolen our exercise in self-government from us. And we need to work to return it to the American people. And I think that's going to be Democrats and Republicans. I do. And I refuse to accept the idea that the Republican Party will be, for the rest of our lives, is going to be defined by the cynicism and the malevolence of Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell and, you know, Rupert Murdoch and Fox News. I don't have to have that for my operating theory because my operating theory still is about unifying people instead of dividing people, but it sure would move us along the road faster if the Republicans could move beyond that view of the world. We have about four minutes left. I want to make sure that we, <clears throat> you mentioned climate change a, co a couple times. I want to make sure we talk a little bit about your plan and, and especially how that uh, affects farmers and ranchers. How are, are, how are they affected by um, the, you know, this issue? Are they part of the solution? So I hear a lot on the campaign trail from people who say, um, we need to act urgently on climate change. And there are a lot of people from the next generation who say, you guys better act, because if you don't act, we're not going to be able to act, which makes it existential for them in a way that the other issues aren't, you know, like issues of education or health care. And I agree with them. I agree with them. We need to act urgently. We have to act urgently. But this also shows the frailty of, our, of what we're accepting in our existing politics. Because if you accept the world where we are consigned forever as a democracy to a situation where I go in as president and I put my policies in and the next president rips them out, or I go in as a majority of Democrats in the Congress and we put our policies in for two years and they win a majority and they rip it out, if that indeed is our future, and I reject that future. Others don't. I reject it. I think we have to reject it. If we accept that as our future, I would argue you can't fix climate change. Because climate change can't be fixed in two years. You need a generational commitment. You need to act with urgency. And you need to create a durable solution that can last beyond two years, four years, eight years, 16 years. Which is not to say that you don't change the plan during the course of the time. But the commitment has to be there. So you can't accept a national party unless you're going to have one single party rule forever, which I don't think we are. You can't accept the national party that denies the climate change is real. And we have one right now because of Citizens United. That's the only reason we have it. 
So I've tried, you know, I've spent years in Colorado meeting with farmers and ranchers, most of whom are Republicans, many of whom didn't vote for me, but who know that their farms and ranches are deeply at risk because of climate change and because of the drought that we're suffering in Colorado. And they're worried about it because they want to know that they can turn their farm or ranch over to their, their children or their grandchildren. That's all they care about. That is all they care about. Okay. And all of that's at risk because of climate change. They have been completely uninvited to the meeting on climate change. And they, they, the, the Koch brothers think they can play them as patsies, you know, arguing that their economic interests and the Koch brothers' are economic interests are aligned. I don't think that's true because the most, the best mathematicians I've ever met in my life are farmers and ranchers. And so I don't think that's a claim that's going to stand up for much longer. And so I wrote my climate plan to, to focus it in areas that other candidates are focused on, like massive new investments in clean tech, making sure that th there's something unique to my plan, making sure that we are exporting that clean tech to support American businesses and to compete with China around the world to make sure we don't lose our leadership there, which we are right now in the world, uh, cutting emissions in the built environment by 50 percent, cutting emissions by transportation by 50 percent by 2030. But there's a focus in my plan on conservation because I think there is uh, a massive opportunity here for farmers and ranchers to participate in the solution on climate change by sequestering um, carbon in our soil and in the working lands of this country. Um, that's not going to be an easy political sell. It's going to be something that you know some people will resist. I recognize that. I acknowledge that. But it is my way of beginning to try to breach the partisan jam, you know log jam that exists between rural America and urban America on, on, on these questions. And that, so that, that's a very intentional, you know, that my, I, 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 I could have picked lots of different things. The reason I picked it there was to try to answer my own question about how do we bring rural and urban America back together again? How do we bring Republicans and Democrats back together again? How do we not accept this as a permanent state of things? Why? Not because I care that much, I guess, about whether it's a permanent state of things, but I really care that much about whether we address climate change in a meaningful way, and I really care that much about whether we can change the equation so that our education system's driving opportunity, not restraining people from opportunity, and I really care that we don't spend the next 10 years in a hollow debate over health care instead of actually getting it to people who need it. That's why my health care plan starts in rural areas. I mean, I, I was in Jackson County, Colorado, not that long ago. It's like many counties in Iowa, much bigger <laughs> in geography. Only 1,000 people live there. And, you know, there were 25 or 30 people in the meeting. No one had health insurance except the school principal who got it through the school, the, the county commissioner who didn't have it before he was elected to the county commission. And there was a couple there who were working 50 hours a week. They had come back to the community. The guy had grown up in the community. They bought the restaurant that had a bowling alley attached to it. And he said to me, Michael, I have two slots to hire for, and I can't hire anybody. I cannot hire anybody. And my wife and I have had to cut back. They were in their 50s. My wife and I have had to cut back our, our hours because I can't. I'm, we're killing ourselves. And they had no health insurance. And I said, why can't you hire anybody? And he said, because they'll have to lose their welfare. They'll have to give up their welfare. What's their welfare? Their Medicaid. So we all live in a country where we're going to accept in a rural community that people that are working 50 hours a week can't have health insurance, and people that want to go to work for those people that are working 50 hours a week have to give it up in order to work for them. Well, that is insane. They, buy it under Obamacare? they can't afford it. They, can't. Exact, they cannot afford it. This is it's a great question. Great question. They can't afford it. We're out of time. No, <laughs> it, can I answer it though? Yeah. Great, yeah. No, yeah. but great question, because there's no market in rural America for health care. And so we have millions of people, and this is exactly what my plan was designed for. This is not exactly what Bernie's plan is designed for, I can assure you that. There are millions of people in America who are making too much money to be on Medicaid but not enough money to afford private insurance, even with the subsidies, because there is no market where they live, or for other reasons. But that is a re big reason why. And the public, that is what the public option is meant to address. And that's why we should have had a public option as part of the Affordable Care Act, 
we, we and we didn't we didn't well I can tell you after we the this is ends why that was <laughs> but but we weren't able to do it and and it left a gaping hole and that gaping hole needs to be filled but that gaping hole being filled is only I would argue is you know 10% of what we have to do, 90% is dealing with the cost issue that, you know, the drug costs and the health care costs that are still destroying America's, you know, economic prospects as a country. It's destroying the ability of people to start and maintain and grow small businesses and live their lives as humans. So there is a lot of work we've got to get to. And frankly, I don't see any way of getting to it unless we figure out a way to depoliticize it, which we have to find a way to do. We are at the end of our hour, so why don't you take one minute to wrap up? Well, <laughs> I'll take one minute to wrap up by saying thank you. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I, 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 I believe we are at a profound inflection point in this democracy's history. I think we've been in places before that have been as challenging. In fact, I would argue they've been more challenging than they are today. And, and, I, and I think the only answer to this is, is for Americans to step up and reclaim their democracy. I think that's the only answer. It will not happen any other way. We started the conversation on guns. People need to see a model of what that looks like. It looks like moms against gun violence and the way they're organizing. It looks like the Parkland kids and the way they're organizing. It looks like the Colorado Compact that I described earlier that allows there to be an organized foundation for a bipartisan result on immigration. And we, it looks like creating a new politics for this country, and we've done it before. We, the most recent time, well, the, the time I mentioned earlier was the end of the Gilded Age. I think that's an analog analogous position to where we are today with the income inequality, lack of economic mobility, and corruption of our public institutions. And nobody's going to fix it except for the American people and their elected representatives that are committed to helping them do that. I hope to do that as president. That's the, my how I will end. Okay, all right. Thank you so much, Senator Bennett, and thanks to everybody for watching. Please come back to DesMoinsRegister.com for more candidate interviews and also the best news you'll find anywhere about the Iowa caucuses. Thank you.